Hmm. How many cookies will Cookie Monster cook in this particular amount of ovens and this particular amount of years? Hmm. Oh, I got it. Yeah, that sort of adds up. Oh, hey! Hello! Uh, shalom, if you will. I'm just doing some basic math stuff in here. Oh, don't worry, you'll get the reference later in this video, I promise. Do you know my, that my second name is Sephardic Jewish? At least I know I know that I don't have a reason to go back into the far right unless I have to want to reenact the ramblings of Ben Shapiro. I live to beat Nazis with a bat. I'm the Donnie Donovitz of my generation, father! Wait! But why is there such an irrational hatred of Jews or people who are minimally Jewish like me? Well, I mean, the last thing I know is those and Seth MacFarlane Family Guy sketches where they portray stereotypical Jews, but anyone who wouldn't know there is a whole ideology based on that. Well, sadly, there is a whole ideology behind antisemitism, one that lasted since centuries up until today, and you'll figure out antisemitism itself is deeply rooted in fiction, lies, and complete bonkers fabrications. Not to mention anti-Semitism has celebrities backing it up somehow, like including Kanye West, J.K. Rowling, and that guy who directed the ugliest Jesus movie ever and also did Braveheart. I guess you might think these are failures of authority who are right about whatever they drop this dispute on Jews. You're wrong, because in today's video, we're going to tackle and debunk the most common anti-Semitic myths and conspiracy theories one by one and tackle the most prominent pundits on this term. But first, let's learn some basic history lessons. Part 1. A brief history of anti-semitism in case you didn't already skip this damn video. So in order to further understand where all the modern anti-semitic viewpoints come from, let's just learn some background history about Jewish people and anti-semitism in general all across the ages. This is just basically a cheap ass world map I bought from Alibaba just for this video anyway. I guess it will do nicely for future video backgrounds. I wonder why Alexandra Ocasio Cortez did talk to H Bomber guy instead of me. Anyway, the history of Jewish people and their origins is still a bit uncertain even to modern science and archaeology, given that our only testament of it are biblical texts, religious texts, and all that sort of nonsense, which people are still debating to this day. I guess you could count on the accounts of fellow of Alexandria and call it a day. Archaeology is such a mess. According to biblical texts, Jews originated from Canaan, considered to be modern day Israel, as the 12 tribes that are described as to be descendants of the 12 sons of Jacob. They migrated to ancient Egypt during the Bronze Age, and they become nearly all slaves building pyramids and all that sort of crap. And except for Moses, who freed all those Hebrew people from the grip of the Pharaoh with the usual Moses stuff going on. You know what I'm talking about if you've seen Prince of Egypt, come on. Moses' successor Joshua conquered in Canaan again, and later on Canaan will split an, into both the Kingdom of Israel and the Kingdom of Judah. Does it say that nearly all modern Jews descend in some way from those in the Kingdom of Judah, while the Kingdom of Israel at the north was destroyed around 1720 BCE and conquered by neo Assyrian Empire, only leaving the Kingdom of Judah to remain prosperous. Then Alexander the Great came all the way from Greece and took over, and while way later the Romans took over afterwards, renaming said Kingdom of Judea. Ancient anti-Semitism or negative views against Jews before the Roman Empire don't really hold too much too many similarities to modern anti-Semitic viewpoints of today. Maybe except for some bit of animosity or and a tiny bit of hostility, maybe, but that's not much compared to today. That's besides the point. The point is, with the arrival of the Roman Empire, the real shit happens, starting in 19 BCE, where relations were between Jews and the Roman Empire started growing more and more hostile, as rebellions in Judea started to happen due to the Roman Empire's persecution of non-Roman non religious beliefs. It's funny because, after all, Roman gods are basically a reskin of Greek gods, I don't think you could tell the difference between Zeus and Jupiter, to be honest. According to Jerusalem Talmud, though, a giant Jewish revolt against the Roman Empire in Judea, called the Kokhba Revolt in 132-136 CE, happened because Emperor Hadrian outlawed 
Jewish circumcision because he thought it was some sort of child mutilation that Romans thought was non-consensual. Despite the fact that Romans like to have non-consensual sex with underage boys. Wow, imagine the sort of nonsense going on today with modern right-wing movements. This revolt resulted in Hadrian getting absolutely mad, sending his legions to Judea and annihilating millions of Jews under Roman sword, resulting even in the destruction of the Temple of Judea. And you might imagine this is not the only revolt that resulted in such a bloodbath. Then, Jesus happened, according to the New Testament, of course, and this will carry a lot more anti-Semitic discourse with it, such as the New Testament verse in Matthew 27-25. More on that later, honey. Also, Muhammad arrived as well, and with it, there's even more anti-Semitism, according to various texts in the Quran, and really, it's a fucking mess. And you might be thinking, duh, Jesus was also Jewish, maybe they're just giving him a chance, for which I have to tell you, no! You're not paying attention, no wonder why my viewer attention is ass! During the rule of the Christian Roman Empire specifically, after Emperor Constantine, Jews became the victims of religious intolerance and political oppression, as Christianity became the de facto religion of the Roman Empire and thus Christian literature started showing hostility towards Jewish people. By the 5th century, things have got even worse. The edicts of the Codex Theodosianus, and no, this is not from Warhammer 40k, believe it or not, in the year 438, expelled Jews from the civil service, the army, and the legal profession. By then, accusations of Jewish deicide against Jesus were starting to spread around. The famous accusation that Jews killed Jesus Christ. Um, more on that later. During the Dark Ages, or Middle Ages, whatever you want to call them, I'm not here to judge on your delicate historian palette, in the Middle Ages, many places, especially in Western Europe and the sword, started persecuting Jews to the extent of expulsions, forced conversions, blood libel, killings, and genocide, even to the point that Christians believed in the 20th century that Jewish people had satanic magic in their hands. That's gonna be some fucking Borat logic. If this car drive into a group of gypsies, Will there be any damage to the car? Although I will not complain if I had magic in my hands, I consider my magic a way to do HRT. Woo! This especially reached to Aklamas during the Crusades, starting with the first in 2696. By then, the expulsions of Jewish people were so many, Jewish people kept moving all over the place, especially to countries like Poland. And in terms of my own country, in Spain especially, in 1492, Ferdinand II of Aragon and Isabella I of Castile, especially nearly all Jews from Spain, especially the Sephardi ones, who will flee into the Ottoman Empire or Palestine to avoid the Spanish Inquisition. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition! And you think it wouldn't be worse in Muslim territories? Oh no, in Muslim territories in Pal like Palestine and such, they will face forced conversions or death. Fucking hell! And if that wasn't worse, the Black Plague happened, and that was surely a perfect excuse for Europeans to blame Jews for it again. So Jews didn't stop emigrating, they will even flee to the United States for centuries, as centuries pass, they will still be persecuted even in the US, Henry fucking Ford from the Ford Company is spewing anti-Semitic shit in a newspaper, anti-Semitic cartoons were made, and around the 19th to 20th centuries in Russia, the Tsar will send Jewish people to pogroms. Jim fucking Flynn! Not only that, in Russia especially, that saw the coming of a book called The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is a book where many of the anti-Semitism of today will share views with. It, it, and it's full of bullshit. More on that later. By now we know there's a guy popping by, by the name of Karl Marx, who is like, how about we seize the means of production and... BOOM! Here comes the Soviet Union, baby! Meanwhile, after World War I, on Austria and Germany, a failed, uh, failed Austrian painter by the name of Adolf Hitler wrote Mein Kampf, which normally will share a lot of anti-Semitic views of old, but it also formed the basis of a little ideology called National Socialism. Then he started causing a ruckus in Germany for a bit, got elected as Chancellor, and... Whoops! 
Looks like Nazi Germany is born and it expanded to a whole bunch of territories where Jews were living in. Like Poland. But in the meantime, the British Empire saw all of this going on and said, hmm, maybe we should help the Jews escaping from Europe with having a land of our own in that little colony we got that was called Palestine. And for the first time ever, after so many centuries, the Jews will finally have a land of their own, conveniently called Israel. However, by now, you just know the rest of the story. Jews have ended in concentration camps. Six million died in Nazi territory alone. And finally, Nazi Germany was defeated by both the Allies and the Soviets in 1945. You might think to yourself that this is where it all ended. Basically, like all evil anti-Semitism is gone. Like, Mrs. Obama, we did it. We have ended anti-Semitism. It didn't end there at all. In fact... Modern anti-Semitic, modern neo-Nazi movements have just rebranded time and time again to try to fit in with society today. Sometimes even adopting progressive ideas and causes like stealing their homework, kind of like the German Nazis with the socialism back in before World War II. Anti-Semitism is an ideology that persisted and persists today. And now that you have a basic grasp of its history, history let's deep dive into the nitty-gritty of the situation. Part 2. Jews have too much power, apparently. I think you might have heard this statistic before. Jewish people account for 0.2% of the world population. But because of this, it somehow ties to anti-Semitic theories about how this tiny minority is not only on a constant craving for total world domination, but it's already under control of banks, the media, industry, government, even the fucking weather somehow. White supremacists usually borrow the progressive Occupy Wall Street talking point of the 1% to refer to this anti-Semitic point, as in all of the 1% rich people of the world are basically Jews. This is not true, and that's besides the point for now. The point is that this is basic primary anti-Semitism point, and, as, and as, as if it was the most prominent across many anti-Semites today. You see all these infographics made by Nazi pricks with all the portraits of executives at a massive corporation like CNN or BlackRock, accompanied by a star dairy, I think, indicating that somehow the majority of the higher-ups controlling these corporations are Jewish, thus Jews bad, I assume. However, as you might find later in this video, this is yet another perpetrated lie made by white supremacists in the sword to try to mainly deflect themselves from their privilege. And a lot of these people spotting this nonsense, if not just by having the grounds and evidence to sustain it, are pretty much damaged in the head. DZ Council member Trion White Senior ranted on a Facebook video from his car during a snowfall that somehow the Jewish Rothschilds control the weather to such an extent that they are able to inconvenience Trion White with a tiny snowfall. It just started snowing out of nowhere this morning, man. Y'all better pay attention to this climate control, man. This climate manipulation. And DC keep talking about we're a resilient city. And that's a model based off the Rothschilds controlling the climate to create natural disasters. They can pay for it and own the cities, man. Be careful. You'll also notice I have to grab this footage from Fox News and Tucker Carlson because this is the only evidence remaining of this Facebook video, apparently. Oh, does it sound funny to you, Tucker, when you could easily spout the same bad trap today? Well, look how that turned out, buddy. There also has been around 2008 a wave of videos on YouTube where Jewish people all blame for not just the 2008 economic crisis on the Great Depression, but also for things like 9-11 or any crisis really. Well, it's true that these crises will end up benefiting the bourgeoisie class at the end of the day, it still isn't entirely Jews. Most of the richest 1% of the world's population are basically white dudes or non-Jewish people. There's a whole diversity amongst the richest people. However, this is often exaggerating by depicting Jews as evil plotters whose only goal is to do harm by lying, cheating, and manipulating others for profit or personal gain, which is a common anti-Semitic trope we'll tackle later. But again, where does this anti-Semitic trope come from? Well, we'll just have to travel back in time 200 years ago or so and meet our tyrannical friend, Napoleon again. What did, why did I put that in my mouth? What the fuck? 
Back in the Napoleonic Wars, there was a man with a surname named Satan who wrote a story from June 1815 about how Nathan Rothschild of the Rothschild's family witnessed the French army's defeat and used his advanced knowledge of the victory to make a fortune in a stock exchange, benefiting from France's total defeat. But despite a sea storm confining all ships to port, he paid a fisherman to ferry him through wind and waves to England and arrived 24 hours before the official news of Wellington's victory, allowing him to export his knowledge and gain 20 million francs in a single coup. Later it was found 200 years later that this story was a complete fabrication. Satan here was originally a left-wing controversialist called George Sternvale, who held malicious anti-Semitic intents behind the writings. Just so you have a basic idea that even left-wing grifters existed in the fucking Napoleon Wars, it was also discovered that Nathan Rothschild wasn't even in England, not even in Waterloo, the place where he's supposed to be at the moment, or even Belgium, where all this transpired, it was discovered 200 years later. Better late than never, I guess. Regardless, this was planted the seeds of all sorts of conspiracy theories about the Rothschilds. They had been blamed for instigating the American Civil War, for plotting to assassinate Abraham Lincoln and JF Kennedy, or even controlling the economy. You know, the thing a lot of rich white people do the most? More than Jews, even? Hey, you remember the protocols of Elders of Zion? I know you did. You got past the time from this video. Good job. Most of these anti Semitic points come especially from that book, which answers Surprisingly enough, it was also a complete work of fiction. <laughs> the book goes on to quote unquote reveal how there was a Jewish plan for global domination, taking over industries, infiltrating governments, and using their stranglehold on media to advance their hidden agenda, all planned within a single night in a single meeting. Now, I'll be straightforward with you, honey. This sounds like right wing deflection more than a revelation, if you know what I'm saying. No such meeting ever happened, and the book was entirely a bunch of bunkers lies and a complete fabrication. But the Perkles had so much attention that it was translated in multiple languages and was disseminated all around the globe. And you wanna know what the funniest part? This book is also plagiarism. <laughs> The book was originally copying verbatim a satirical book about Napoleon III, which is not about Jews, called Dialogue in Hell Between Machiavelli and Montesquieu, which was written by Morris Jolly in 1864. There's also other traces of literary works of the Protocols plagiarized, such as Hermann Gottsch's Burritz from 1868. This act of plagiarism was exposed by the Times in 1921, the year of fucking polio and the Tulsa Race Massacre. Imagine being so utterly ignorant that ignorant people call you out for being ignorant. The saddest reality of this is that this complete work of lies and fiction will arrive in the hands of Hitler himself through the Nazi party ideologue Alfred Rosenberg and later on in Nazi Germany tabloid Der Sturmer, one of Goebbels' tools for Nazi propaganda will spew the same garbage detailing the Jews' secret plans against Nazi Germany. The secret calls of the Jewish people are laid out in the protocols of the elders of Sion. They contain the Jewish plan for war conquest. The Jews will fight without pity. We must also fight without pity against Panjuri. The Jewish people must be exterminated from the face of the earth. Ah yes, lovely gobble shit. <laughs> This same diarrhea of the mouth will get to the mouth of Henry Ford, owner of the Ford Company back then, so he could write his nonsense on his newspaper pieces. The irony of all of this is that this wouldn't go without consequences. In 1935, a Swiss court fined two Nazi leaders for circulating the German edition of the Burkholz in Switzerland for being libelous and obvious forgeries. Although, I'll be honest, this was just a slap in the wrist to Nazis compared to Hitler's and Goebbels' whole entire propaganda machine. Now, you wouldn't think these theories don't resonate with fascists today and that nobody thinks these protocols are true to this day and age, don't you? <laughs> Have you learned nothing? Pay attention, class! One of the biggest proponents of this very conspiracy theory, which is a complete lie, is the famous rapper Kanye West, or yay. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't say that with a straight face, so I'm just gonna call him Kanye. Kanye said this in the Lex Friedman podcast around October 24, 2022. 90% of black people in entertainment, from sports to music to acting, 
are in some way tied into Jewish business people. There's a Jewish person right there controlling the, the, the country, the Jewish people controlling that who gets the best video or not, controlling what the media says about me. Per- ah, yes, Kanye. You might think Jews control your rap career, but you couldn't definitely control your divorce. <laughs> Uh, I'm fucking mean. It might seem ironic at this point, Kanye is also rubbing shoulders recently with other white supremacist figures and far-right figures like Trump, Nick Fuentes, and Richard Spencer. Even had a talk with Alex Jones at Infowars looking like a Batman villain. But the whole gist of this is that Kanye, unfortunately for him, has been used like a useful idiot by the majority of these far-right goons until it's not useful anymore for them. To be frank, the irony of all of this is that as it has been proven throughout all of this history I told you about at the start of this video, Jews had little to no power influence or control over their own fate. You have to remember they had to go through programs in the Holocaust, they faced their own genocide through the ages, and the idea that they are people that simply the control of the world's fate is just absurd given that circumstance. There's also the fact that Jewish people are not a monolithic entity, they do not entirely share the same unified agenda and like any other ethnicity, there's even amongst Jews an intellectual and ideological diversity. Just need to look at Ben Shapiro or Dennis Prager, for instance. Part 3. Disloyal to who? Fucking Aquaman? <laughs> this is another classic anti-Semitic viewpoint. The suspicion that Jews hold allegiance only to their kind and to a uniquely Jewish agenda where they're often seen as untrustworthy neighbors and citizens. Pretty much like any other minority in the US. America. I already mentioned how Jews are not really a monolithic, monolithic entity enough to guarantee this, but you all know this sounds like a load of horse manure, but could we identify the roots of this theory actually? Let's find out. I realize I gave someone away some Bart Bacon's PTSD. Damn. This belief has its roots in the Christian New Testament. Judas is said to have betrayed Jesus by offering Jesus to the authorities for money, and Judas' name has become synonymous with traitor ever since. Even in the Divine Comedy, Judas is right into Lucifer's mouth in the last circle of hell being chewed on for the sin of treachery alongside Brutus and Cassius, the guys who murdered Caesar. Judas just happens just to be right in the middle mouth if it wasn't clearly evident that Dante Alighieri should have posted the Divine Comedy on Wattpad. <laughs> Oh, don't worry. If you're a literature geek, you'll get that reference easily. The Quran has also texts and references that question an identical Jewish scrupulousness. This will be beliefs that will drive the majority of the decisions in the Dark Ages against Jewish people, more specifically in Christian Europe. Back to the lovely gobble shit. <laughs> Hitler and other anti-Semites of the Nazi party baselessly blamed German Jewish soldiers for stabbing their army on their backs, thus attempting to stake future victories for Germany on the eradication of Jews whom Hitler viewed as disloyal. Jewish people were blamed as well for communism and socialism, you know, the ideology that Hitler took his party's name from, as they were pretty much cast out as agitators. You see listicles and infographics as well, like a lot amongst anti-Semites and white supremacists, listing which people are Jewish and hold allegiances to Israel or something. Like the QAnon Conspiracies podcast Upfront with the Prophetic, which posted in social media a whole list of dual citizenship American Israeli US Senate and Congress representatives who seemingly hail the radical left. Donald Trump also alluded to this conspiracy theory, according to an article in the Washington Post, mentioning how he said that Jewish people who vote Democrat were very disloyal to Israel while trying to deny his remarks as anti-Semitic. I mean, this is coming from the massive fraud narcissist who said Israelis love him like he's the second coming of God. I don't know. I think you should all consider that Jews, like any other immigrant to the US or anywhere else, usually have a connection to Israel for any reason, whether it is religious, ideological, familial, or even emotional. I don't think they even need to be loyal to the right-wing government of Israel or Zionists even. Like I said previously, they have a diversity of thought, and this is also the case with other ethnicities as well, even white people. But 
fine. Now, I guess like Ben Shapiro says, not every Jew is a real Jew, right? Huh. Part 4. Let's talk money. I think this is a bit of a funny white supremacist talking point because I personally have a tiny bit of Jewish ancestry probably and I don't usually have a lot of money currently. Okay, so if you know Jewish tradition for a bit, you know that their act of giving money to marginalized groups is called tzedakah and it's usually considered in Judaism as a required act of justice. It's weird because despite this altruism, anti-Semites tend to tie this to, into the superstition that Jews are stingy and good with money. Look, listen, I have a Sephardic second name and I don't even know shit on how to save money. This is also a problem because despite this, neither in Europe or nor the US are Jewish people richer than the average population. Jews in Bulgaria and other European places, for instance, have below minimum wages and have to live in massive debt. The US can be noticeably worse as Jewish people in the US show the widest disparity of households with incomes below the federal poverty level, between 3 and 28 percent, with New York being the worst case, often not being able to access social security and other critical benefits. And despite all of this, anti-Semites tend to believe that wealth is underserved on Jews. Why is this a common theme in anti-Semitic territory? It's time to travel back to the Dark Ages again. The stereotype of the greedy Jew has its origins in the Middle Ages in Christian Europe, where there was Christian law to consider usury a sin, but Jews were forbidden to own land or to work in the craft sector due to, you guessed it, discriminatory laws. It was then where Jews had to become other sorts of professions by necessity, such as merchants, money lenders, and tax collectors. This which made them easy scapegoats in all sorts of economic crises. My brothers in Christ, if you wanted to stop usury from happening, maybe you should not leave people no other choice than doing usury, I'm just saying. Jewish people are often depicted as greedy villains in literature and art of the times, one case being Shylock from Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. This stereotype and this piece of literature will work their way into modern vernacular to juice someone down which become a common expression meaning to bargain unscrupulously for a lower price. In a Drink Champs interview on October 16th, 2022, Kanye, again, has alluded to this sort of Jewish greed. Jewish people have owned the black voice. The Jewish community, especially in the music industry, they'll take, in the entertainment period, they'll take one of us, the brightest of us, right, that can really feed a whole village, and they'll take us and milk us till we die. You know, Kenny is not the only one to think like this. If you're familiar with black nationalism for a bit, you know that Kanye is just talking the same nonsense as Nation of Islam's Louis Farrakhan. Louis Farrakhan and Nation of Islam are pretty much very interesting entities indeed, not to mention they're completely nuts. Back in the 90s, the Nation of Islam organization had ties with the Church of Scientology thanks to musician Isaac Hayes and embraced Dianetics in 2010. Just so, so just, just so you know, to get the idea that people coming with anti-Semitic nonsense are mentally crazy. Back in the 60s, the Nation of Islam also had ties with the KKK to purchase some farmland in the Deep South. It was so bad that the founder of the American Nazi party, George Lincoln Rockwell, called them the Hitler of the black men. If the founder of the American Nazi party calls you the Hitler of the black men, you know you're doing something fucked up. Unsurprisingly enough, this stereotype of the greedy Jew has also been portrayed in more modern media as well. I'm pretty sure you've seen Family Guy at some point. But the most egregious, egregious and recent example of someone who wears a facade of progressivism and women's rights in the recent discourse, and you know pretty much who I'm talking about. I guess I'm gonna piss off some Potter head or something. I don't know. J.K. Rowling, famous writer of Harry Potter, holds very transphobic and bigoted views. I'm pretty sure you know this by now, but little do you know that her transphobia ties back to a tiny bit of old anti-Semitism as well. If you read or watch Harry Potter, you heard of the goblins, which are, who are pretty much depicted in an anti-Semitic manner, often as money-grabbing greedy cabals or bankers in the wizarding world. 
The movies just make them look even worse by depicting them as if they were literal Nazi propaganda and in the Gringotts Bank, on the floor there's a gigantic star of David there making some implications. You'd honestly say that thoughtless racist tropes are all too common in fantasy and science fiction, like the aliens in the Star Wars prequels trilogy, but even then these still hold up to somehow in the worst of the ring world and J.K. Rowling's work even outside their creative output. If you look again at Howard's legacy, these sorts of anti-Semitic tropes are reinforced again through the same goblins. Even the goblin horn is clearly a Jewish shofar. Let's stop denying the obvious. J.K. Rowling has direct control of the Western Wearing World and the Harry Potter franchise, at least you should know how to stop funding her work. And let's face it, often her transphobic views share a common source with a lot of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories as well, so it can, just, it can be just thoughtless racism, honestly. The truth is, Jews have existed in a wide range of socioeconomic statuses, and the most important thing about this is, not every rich person is a Jew. Look at Elon Musk, for instance. He's pretty much a white dude coming from apartheid South Africa, and he's, he's, he's he used to be the richest dude on the planet. If you really think he's Jewish for some reason, you'll be clearly off the rails. The same way as anybody else, not all Jews are either good with money, because even if it means as a compliment, it can contribute to a very dangerous stereotype. Just look at me, I had to get rid of a crippling gambling addiction. Isn't that very telling? Isn't it? Part 5 Bird Boy Oh, that's a cool name for a death metal band. Maybe I should... Oh, no, wait. There's already a band called like that. Cool band, though. Everyone and their mom knows the full story to some degree of Jesus Christ and how the crucifixion went. Even if you're not a Bible thumper, you should at least have heard about it from somewhere because, well... Christianity is just literally splattered all everywhere. In 30 CE, Pontius Pilate was the governor of Judea, and he presided over Jesus' trial and gave the order for his crucifixion. The evidence of all the Republican stories on Jesus, including his crucifixion, are all flimsy and sustained over foundations of sand. And there's barely any archaeologists or historians who can agree on the story at some degree. But you need to understand that these events took place in a complicated social context, and the only apparent testimony we got of these is from the Bible, more precisely, the New Testament. In the New Testament, Jesus is said to have been tried before in a Jewish judicial body called the Sanhedrin. And no, this doesn't sound like an Lord of the Rings place, but I think it's fair to consider the Bible and Tolkien's work to be similar works of fiction. This was done before Jesus was turned over to Roman authorities. During the crucifixion itself, there's a Bible verse in Matthew 27 25 that a lot of white supremacists like to point out, at least in the King James Version. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Amen! This is probably meant to depict Jews in this story as a bloodthirsty lynch mob, which is, if not just sugar coated with republican purposes, a complete lie. Since experts have gathered that, while Jesus was certainly subversive for the politics of the time, him, who was not perceived as particularly threatening or enraging to the Jews around him. Also, uh, Jesus was Jewish and the only non-Jews are the Romans there, so take that however you will. This has been discredited by Pope Paul VI and the Vatican in 1964 in his declaration on the relation of the church to non-Christian religions, which states that the crucifixion of Jesus cannot be charged against all the Jews without distinction then alive nor against the Jews of today. That wouldn't stop anti-Semites of today, though, to spread the idea that all Jews killed Jesus, somehow. And even in my language, there's this book perpetuating this anti-Semitic myth, Why Jews Killed Jesus, an exhaustive investigation of Judaism and the source of their hatred towards Christ. Oh, don't worry, if you don't yet think Rolando Perez Sanchez is criminally insane, just look at the rest of his ebook collection in Amazon, which is a lovely 100 books of lovely religious diatribe. But we're only scratching the surface of the loony bin that compresses a personality surrounding this anti-Semitic theory. For this time, we like to look at Hollywood, or ex-Hollywood personality, who is crazier than all of these people. Male. Fucking Gibson. Mel Gibson is the biggest proponent of the deicide theory in anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. 
He's been in multiple nerd roles such as Braveheart, Mad Max until they replace him, and more importantly, he's directed a glorified snuff film called The Passion of the Christ. I'm afraid I cannot show much of this movie scenes without scratching the immense gore in this film. Otherwise, YouTube will crucify me! <laughs> See, I made the pun. Here, Pontius Pilate is shown to have been entirely reluctant to sentence Jesus, only to go through with it when he is blackmailed into submission by Jewish authorities. If you don't think that's fun to hear, here, have his demon baby that looks at like Bern Troyer. Not the ramblings of a madman, definitely. Other than that, the movie is filled to the brim with gruesome gore, and it's pretty much an excuse for Mel Gibson to shove the bubble in your face, speaking tongues in Latin in an expensive church. The film script has got somehow in the hands of a joint committee, the Secretary of Ecumenical and Interreligious Affairs of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops and the Department of Interreligious Affairs of the ADL. Yeah, say that in one sentence, honey. And they made a statement denouncing the film, calling it one of the most troublesome sects related to anti-Semitic potential that any of us had seen in 25 years. It must be emphasized that the main storyline presented Jesus as having been relentlessly pursued by an evil cabal of Jews headed by the high priest Caliphas, who finally blackmailed a weak-kneed pilot into putting Jesus to death. This definitely the storyline that fuel centuries of anti-semitism within Christian societies. This also has a storyline rejected by the Roman Catholic Church of the Vatican in its document Nostra Aetate and by nearly all mainland Protestant churches in parallel documents. Unless this basic storyline has been altered by Mr. Gibson, a French Catholic who is building his own church in the Los Angeles area and who apparently accepts neither the teachings of the Vatican second, nor modern biblical scholarship, the passion of the class retains a real potential for undermining the repudiation of classical Christian anti-Semitism by the searchers in the last 40 years. I have it dumped. Mel Gibson made this movie under the company Icon Productions. The longer the icons on Earth, the stronger he will become. And funnily enough, this is the same company that made What Women Want in 2000. You know, I'm starting to wonder why Icon Productions is independent at this point. I actually can't talk too much about this because I apparently got a season that says letter from Mel Gibson himself in the mail. And it looks pretty scary. Let's see here. Um. Oh. Uh. Um. Uh. Oh. Oh. Hold on. This isn't a season that says letter. It's the insane ramblings of a madman. <laughs> Yes, because definitely calling Mel Gibson criminally insane might be an understatement for what I'm going to reveal to you, and it might be very telling for other anti-Semites as well. For starters, Mel Gibson has built an expensive $37 million church in Malibu Hills, California, where a journalist started testifying a bunch of weird stuff going on in there, like several middle-aged women wearing long skirts, frame blouses, flat shoes, and lace bells wandering their church grounds, Mel Gibson giving sermons in Latin, or the fact that its religious ideology is so antiquated it dates back to the 16th century. This, of course, is probably funded with Icon Productions money, so just so you know. But this is not the only time Mel Gibson has done anything unhinged. In fact, on July 28, 2006, Gibson was caught by the Los Angeles police for drunk driving while speeding in his vehicle with an open container of alcohol. Mel Gibson even later attempted suicide by a cop. I'm not even fucking kidding. And he went on an anti-Semitic tirade afterwards. Fucking Jews! The Jews are responsible for all the wars in the world! Are you a Jew? Jesus loves you! In July 2010, Gibson has been recorded during a phone call with his ex-wife Oksana Grigorieva in a racist, abusive tirade yelling at her. I hate home for most of the time. public and it's a fucking embarrassment to me. You look like a fucking bitch on heat. And if you get raped by a pack of <laughs> it'll be your fault. Alright? You need a fucking bat in the side of the head. Alright? How about that? I'm threatening. I'll put you in a fucking rose garden, you cunt. This was so bad, it was soon barred from coming near Oksana and her daughter to a domestic violence related restraining order. This guy's fucking nuts! <laughs> 
For this reason, Mel Gibson has been for decades blacklisted from Hollywood, so he found plenty more reasons to blame the Jews for his blacklisting from Hollywood itself. However, you cannot blame Jews for Mel Gibson being blacklisted, especially when he is already working from the Passion of the Crash sequel and a Mad Max movie. It's basically Mel Gibson's fault for having so many criminal charges that working with him has become uncomfortable. He will yell and rage in movie sets even. Imagine what will be passing through his head right now. And you can say that this is because it's his way to cope with the loss of his child to suicide, but even then the point still remains. If you're willing to listen to the insane anti-Semitic ramblings of this madman on Jews, you might need to double check your mental health as well, buddy. Losing a kid doesn't even justify this. Part 6. Oh no, this is too fucked for me to put a weighted title on. We're already past the point where the anti-Semitic discourse has become more unhinged, and by that I mean that we're going to start talking about the blood level. Blood level is a major theme in anti-Semitic thought and propaganda alongside a barbaric slaughter of animals and kosher slaughter in the story. Blood level being the myth that Jews murder non-Jews, specifically non-Jewish children, in order to use their blood for form religious rituals such as baking matzo bread or something. Oh, you now imagine how fuck that is to think about? I was not lying in the title of this section. Is the anti semites version of Oh, please, will someone think of the children? Except it incited more violence against Jews for centuries. It's an old Christian belief that is based on flimsy, non-existent evidence and is sustained on pure lies. But there's an important thing to consider, which many anti-Semites and white supremacists tend to ignore. Jewish religious law forbids the consumption of blood, animal or human. Even then, I am not surprised how Nazis basically ignore that fact completely. This myth all started in the 12th century England following the death of a boy named William in Norwich. A monk by the name of Monmouth started blaming the local Jews for the boy's murder, with little to no evidence at all, accusing them of trying to enact Jesus' crucifixion. Regardless of how false these accusations were, by the 13th century, he had transformed into blood libel when a blood motive was added to the baseless accusations. A lot of Christians of the time even believed Jews needed instant infant blood to bake their pasta with matzah and even drank it as a medicine of or an aphrodisiac. No surprise how this myth extended further into current days for centuries, often leading to the famous adrenochrome conspiracy theory. Even Mel Gibson again has been bolstering his theory about how Hollywood Jews keep their beauty by just kidnapping children and stealing their blood. <laughs> oh Mel, when will you learn? A more modern take related to current events will be a Bitchute video. Not to mention Bitchute is a dump of garbage. A video by brother Nathaniel in February 2022 where it kills the war in Ukraine is based on Jews' lust for murder and blood and the blood of Ukrainian, American and European NATO soldiers who have curative power for jewelry that puts the Jews on top. I will not like however to show more of this video other than what I can quote from it because I think Bitchud should have been dead by now for obvious reasons. But you have to have a palatial state for Ukraine and NATO inside your head dread free in order to come up with that sort of nonsense. Modern anti-Semites will look up for every single opportunity to spew the lovely gobble shit into current events and tragedies like the Russia opening war of today and to be honest, that's insane people shit. You have to imagine how fucked up the situation is when white supremacists tend to pull off the medieval fantasy shit to try to justify genocide for something that didn't happen. Some murders were attributed to Jews because of a medieval superstition. It just makes no sense. This is absolutely the point where the fun and games of this video probably stops. As we delve in deeper into more fucked up stuff, the fact that people are lying and manipulating others into believing Jews do this sort of fucked up thing is just horrifying. And then Jake simplifies the full extent anti-Semitism will go to justify genociding Jewish people. And speaking of genocide, this next one's all in the mouths of many anti-Semites as well. And it involves such mental gymnastics and denial to the point of justifying more genocide. Part 7. It did happen. Stop lying. Imagine this. All these conspiracy theories, all these lies, all this insane nonsense. They all want to the full extent of causing the systematic genocide of Jews, especially those in Nazi Germany between 1941 and 1945. 
Six million Jews and others were murdered in death camps, concentration camps, ghettos, killing fields, and everywhere else in Nazi Europe. There is practically no denying of it. There's even whole piles of evidence to sustain this number. There's governmental documents, traumatized witnesses and survivors, first-hand admissions of guilt, photos, film, written records, museums, not to mention the remains of concentration camps, gas chambers, and crematoria themselves. This is no exaggerated falsehood. There's no way around it. Six million Jews died in the Holocaust alone and in Nazi Germany. It is a horrifying act of genocide. But even then, to this very day, there's still people out there who will distort, disprove, and conceal the facts of the Holocaust for any reason conceivable. And you should know that Holocaust denial is as old as the Holocaust itself. If you look at Nazi bureaucrats' documents regarding the concentration camps, and yes, those that were made with help of IBM computers, they were just careful enough to cover up the final solution in a bureaucratic language. For instance, Jews were not deported, but according to these documents, they were resettled. Ghettos were condoned up for quarantine. A death march was merely an evacuation. And these were actual words in Nazi documents from Germany. This piece of bureaucratic trickery will reach the mouths of many anti-Semites today. One of the people followed for Nazi bureaucratic propaganda was Kanye again, who masked himself on Infowars to the point of praising Hitler. And he didn't kill 6 million Jews, that's just like factually incorrect. Here's a funny part anyway. Globalist is often a term used to refer to Jewish elites in all these sorts of Infowars conspiracy theories spewed by Alex Jones. But here it seems whatever Kanye spews really scares Alex Jones away for a bit. Well, you know you're being so anti-Semitic you make Alex Jones tremble in fear. You know you're so fucked up. The irony is palpable here. For them, it's all about optics and branding, trying to appeal to rather ignorant masses. Good for bit if you talk about a Jewish elite, but let's just talk about globalists. It's obvious that Alex Jones is not a Hitler-loving douche, but he spews the same literal garbage than Gobbles and Hitler in his rants, sugar-coated with this sort of newspeak. Kanye is just doing the same, but he's doing it in the wrong set of words, at least for Alex Jones himself, and yet Alex brought Kanye in despite anything. Another example of this on this International Holocaust Remembers Day on Twitter, where there's always trending a whole influx of tweets with the hashtag holohoax. Although, given that Elon now runs Twitter, things are going to get worse from here. But in order to understand the consequences and the detriment the Holocaust in our causes, we must learn about its biggest proponent, and that's no more than Johan Weiss's favorite, Nick Fuentes. I swear that Johan Weiss' lord is gonna change on that eventually, I promise. Nick Fuentes is a Catholic white supremacist, presumably from with white Mexican origins, who runs a regular podcast and is a literal neo-Nazi. No, I'm serious, the guy is one of the biggest neo-Nazis in existence all over the internet. You may know him for his nickname, Nick the Knife, since he's so willing to threaten people with a fucking knife. The point is, the guy has optics to keep, which is pretty much a short handle for outside PR for his fascist ideas, and in order to keep said optics, just to make his ideas look not so bad to normies, he has to dance around that term on terminology so much that he's willing to become Nazi Sesame Street. One of these propositions of Holocaust denial is the cookie question. You might have heard of this one, which goes on like something on the lines of How many cookies does Cookie Monster bake in a certain amount of ovens in a certain amount of years? Which leads him to presumptions of possible deniability given that it might lead you to think he's just asking questions. With this is a very common tactic to refer to the theories of Holocaust denial, and the idea of playing around with numbers or reducing them in a way that harmfully questions the original death toll of the Holocaust. And you might realize that he has such problems with optics already, considering he's a big giant neo-Nazi, that he has all to boil down this discourse to Sesame Street levels of infantilizing. Nick Fuentes also said multiple times he wants to desperately re recreate the Holocaust, despite claiming it doesn't exist. How the hell does one deny a genocide on Jews that happened, but what it's so badly to happen again? Great fucking logic, Adolf. The cookie question has been even aped by Jewish right-wing pundits like Ben Shapiro, and I will honestly joke about this lack of self-awareness, but it will be a lack of self-awareness that kills people like him. 
Nick Fuentes often gets kicked off SAPAC due to his immense bad optics, but often gives speeches towards his groipers in his own convention, often being listened by insults and the sort. Listen, if conservatives who might slightly agree with you on anti-Semitic points don't want you anywhere near them, that's really telling. But who knows, maybe Nick the Knives already started recruiting his own army of brown shirts and they're walking among us. They know the Holocaust was real, and not only are they lying about it, but they're also craving to reenact it. And I think this is a great segue to from talking about the Holocaust in hell to talking about the issue with anti-Zionism, because some white supremacists and anti-Semites will draw parallels between the Holocaust and what's really going on between Israel and Palestine and the genocide of Palestinians, which is they lie, they all tie to all Jewish people for some reason. To say this issue is far too complex to summarize in a single section of the video is an understatement, but I'll try my best. The government of Israel for years has been mostly right-wing and spearheaded by right-wing oligarchs, like most likely Netanyahu himself. And it is a problem that can only be tied to the sort of 1% of the higher-ups of the Israeli government. No Jewish people in Israel nor anywhere else agree with the systematic genocide of Palestinians. And again, there's an intellectual and ideological diversity amongst Jews in Israel and all over the globe. Like, not all German people under Nazi Germany, to say the least, agreed with Hitler's policies. It's okay to condemn the, geno the genocide of Palestinians. While Jewish people deserve a land of their own, it is unjustified and often detrimental to Israel's integrity. And they're right to condemn the genocide of Palestinians. Except, the target is wrong. Because condemning this genocide is still not an excuse for anti-Semitism. It isn't an excuse to call all Jewish people murderers or Palestinian children. I know this is a subject that will probably piss off someone in the comments or anywhere else, but consider this. This is just like blaming your average 95 office cubicle workers for the murder of George Floyd. Okay, so, I know you. Judging that you know this since preschool, you might say, Oh, sticks and stones break my bones, but words will never do. But let's face it, that didn't really stop the process of words to suddenly become sticks and stones. Hatred and violence have always shown that they have a basis of narratives. You know, words, which compose sentences that compose a whole narrative around something. The racist stereotype of giving watermelons to people of color didn't start from nowhere. Someone had to say watermelons are childish enough for black people to like to eat somehow. And from these words, as proven in history alone, has carried along the systematic genocide of Jews, whether it is the Holocaust or the genocides of ye old Middle Ages, doesn't really matter. A narrative can lead an action to action given to the wrong hands. Like the start of this video, you might think this is a thing of the past, that we are someone somehow exaggerating the claims of violence or that anti-Semitic violence is a long gone problem, and you'd be clearly mistaken. Violence against Jews and other minorities is still perpetrated today, and the evidence is all over the news. The Pittsburgh synagogue shooting, for instance, was perpetrated by a white terrorist who was seemingly inspired by the Unite the Right rally perpetrated a year prior in Charlottesville, Virginia, which also claimed the life of Heather Heiss back then. This white terrorist was fascinated by not only the words of a right-wing extremist radio host called Jim Quinn, but also by the loads of anti-Semitic dad traps spewed on the Gap social network, which after the shooting was later removed from app stores both on Android and iOS. Although you can still browse Gab in your browser, sadly, which makes you question how little those big tech do to stop violence whenever it is too late, that speaks a lot about good old Susan from the days she was the CEO of YouTube. But what do you usually think is just memeing or shitposting from some people as shown in Gab might just end up having an actual body count later? It's a butterfly effect of the alt-right, so to speak. This means all this star traps spewed by Nazis on Gab had a body count of 11 people which were killing the Pittsburgh synagogue during the shooting, including Jewish people. A lot more, a more recent example is the Texas mall shooting in 2023, where at least 9 people of diverse ethnic origin were killed, including children. 
White supremacists and conservatives tend to deflect on the idea that he's Latino, but proof shows that he's a white supremacist who even wears spastica tattoos on the sort. And another thing to take notice of is that, according to these various social media profiles, he was a listener and big fan of Tim Pool and lips of TikTok especially. You can say all we want about that sort of diatribe just being words, but because next time good old Beanie Tim and Steven Crowder open their mouths, there's going to be an actual body count. These might all sound also completely unrelated, but wear me with me on this. Posse Parker's transphobic rally on New Zealand had a bunch of neo-Nazis show up in support of her, sometimes even yelling anti-Semitic rhetoric all over. The same anti-Semitic rhetoric Parker might also imply sometimes during her transphobic remarks. And the same anti-Semitism that J.K. Rowling displayed in a Harry Potter series with the goblins. It's like transphobia, racism, theories of forced diversity, woke culture, even things like Flat Earth or COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy have their roots in anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. And this proves that this rooted anti-Semitism has deadly consequences, not just for Jewish people but for everyone not in line with the ideology. Body counts and actual deaths are behind this problem, and it all began with the same words. And if you look deeper, it all starts with the same people. Hail Trump! Hail our people! Hail victory! At the end of this road, it makes you wonder, what is the real motive of all this hatred and violence? Was the real reason all this hatred of Jewish people exists in the first place, with all its due consequences? Money and power. Thanks for watching. At the end of this video, I understand your feelings. It feels incredibly depressing to coexist on the same planet with millions of. Idiots spewing hateful and anti-Semitic garbage every day, coming up with more and more unhinged and insane words every time. But you also tend to forget something as a viewer, and that is that you also coexist in the same planet with people who feel exactly the same as you, pretty much as depressed as you are about that. At least the point of this video has been fulfilled. It certainly educated at least a percentage of people viewing this video like you, probably. And if that's the case, good job. Put yourself on the back right now on my behalf. This sort of information, as in whatever I educated my viewers with in this video in a more or less easy to digest way, is power in the right hands. It means the power to do the right things in the right time to do so. And if it wasn't for this sort of information, I will not be able to make this video at all with my purpose in mind. People who believe in anti-Semitic conspiracy theories as we've discussed in this video often have the wrong information or, to put it bluntly, info hazards because they're pretty much either insane or dumb and look, it's pretty easy to be ignorant about things but the wrong kind of crazy can come with its so do problems. However, it's not the main point of this video to go around and attack anti-Semites and assert all day, even in the field of debate. It's not just about that. Neo-Nazis are probably like the Hydra. Once you get a red one, another two pop up in its place. No, that's not the only point of this video. Jewish people have this folklore story about the golem going around where the golem fends of hatred towards Jews in a more peaceful manner, depending on which adaptation you look at. It's a more humane approach of a superhero if you look at it like that. The golem story has also inspired other words like the Iron Giant, where sometimes in the face of a threat, all you need is a kind heart to not just protect Jewish people, but also protect other marginalized voices in the world. That's the whole deal with the golem. Be like the golem. You can tell I pretty much had a similar story to that of Spielberg's Iron Giant. I've been conditioned by hatred, anti-Semitism, and white supremacy for around four years before I had to jump ship, because not only it was uncomfortable to sit around and discuss those things, but also because it was simply harmful and not just for myself. And all that and it all comes from a background of ignorance and a lot of coping mechanisms. Anti-Semitism relies on deflecting a real class struggle normally into ethnicity like Jews that will never probably disappear unless you manage to genocide them all, which is technically impossible. Realizing that there's actually a class struggle as a worker class trans woman and not a race war going on really opened my eyes as I started to learn to grow as a person. 
I even sought to repair all the damage I've done by even attending to LGBT protests or workers' rights protests, and possibly even more than just that. Heck, I am right now doing something positive by educating you about this particular subject. And maybe it isn't just enough with individual action. Maybe you can do something like I do that manages to protect minorities and fend off fascists, and it will not be enough. But this video will hopefully educate future generations like the majority of viewers of this channel to learn not just how to combat hate and anti-semitism, but also how to be kind and protect Jewish people and other groups. So soon, we can hope, unlike history proved before, that history will not repeat, repeat itself. Shalom, motherfuckers.